For a while now, I've been on the lower end of software, both in my language choice, graphics programming APIs, and on my projects. I've met a lot of renderers slash engines, where most of my knowledge transferred between each iteration, but not much of the code. Because I got better at architecting, or at graphics programming, reusing the same code felt like going backwards. But imagine a world where you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to draw a triangle to the screen. It would be nice, no? Making your own model loader for the first time is nice. Learning how to make a software rasterizer using only your CPU is also nice. Dealing with bulk and abstraction hell is also fun for some time. But after some time, you wanna see results different from the same model spinning on the screen, like... Киборг Линус Дройдвальдс от Red Hat успешно заразил миллионы компьютеров вирусом GCC в системе. So I figured, why not try and do the opposite and go for a higher end solution? In this case, a game engine, Godot. It was made by two Argentinian devs, by the way, and I'm Argentinian, by the way. Hashtag Argentina mentioned Messi better than Ronaldo. Anyways, for the past month, I've been diving myself deep in the Godot docs and making a horror co-op game, which I'll be talking about in a later video. And it has helped me a lot to learn how to do stuff in Godot. One thing I was worried about when using a game engine was that I would be tinkering a lot with UIs instead of writing code and building my own systems. But the experience has been quite the opposite. In fact, Godot gives you very little built-in stuff. You have to make your own character FPS camera, your own movement with friction, interaction systems, etc. It gives you the lower level stuff built in, like raycasts so you can interact with objects, material systems so you can edit your object's visual properties, and physics to make the world feel more alive by default. But if you want to make a door interact, you have to make it move by yourself. Same with cabinets, hiding spots, and with breaking items. In this case, to break this base, you have to break the model into little pieces by yourself, and then attach this function as a callback whenever the object collides with something, check that the velocity for it to break is high enough, spawn the broken item, apply an impulse to it and clean up the object after some time. And by the way, that fade out that you see at the end is a shader, so you get to write low level stuff too. It's like you get to do the fun stuff without having to reinvent the wheel each time. Sounds great to me. Godot has many official programming language choices, as well as non-official ones. In my case, I've just tried GDScript and C++. Yes, you've heard it right. C++. I've sinned, I'm sorry. I won't do it again, I promise. Both kind of felt the same, and the examples on how to use the Godot API on both are very similar. The only difference in my experience between both has been that writing C++ required a lot more setup. You have to compile everything using the sconce build system, choose your compiler, and add code as GD extensions. It's a bit less portable since C++ is a bit hard to make cross-platform. The way you debug code is up to you, for example using GDB, and since Godot 4.2 you can have hot reloading which is pretty cool. Meanwhile GDScript is a lot more plug and play. No setup, built-in debugger, built-in editor, which is okay, though I prefer using NeoBIM plus the Godot LS which works great. C++ or C Sharp are useful if you're limited by your CPU frame time. In my case I'm limited mostly on the GPU, but even then most of the functions given to you by the Godot API in GDScript are native and built on C++ itself. So unless you're implementing expensive algorithms or really CPU intensive calculations, you should be fine with GDScript, especially if you use type hints, which help the interpreter optimize stuff. Godot comes with a shading language similar to GLSL. The engine itself hot reloads your shaders when you change them, and it integrates itself a lot with the material system. In here I set the albedo color as well as the emission color on the shader itself. You also get to define your fragment and your vertex shader in the same file, which is so nice coming from GLSL. Normally if you wanted to do this you would have to extend the language, which is no easy task. Adding post-processing shaders is not so hard either. The one I'm using right now is a modified version of the original PS1 shader in GodotShaders.com. You can also set the values of uniforms in shaders from the Godot editor itself, as well as through code. In in fact, pretty much every single value is editable. For example, if you hover in the position value, it tells you the property name and how to access it. So you can change it like this. Also, notice how I use mesh instance 3D. This selects the node on my node tree 
and the on ready value tells Godot to automatically edit when the node is ready. There's also the export annotation, which exports a value to the editor. Very useful to attach scenes or object references. GDScript also has other language commodities like built-in math operations for vectors and matrices, which are very nice to use, and tweens, which call a callback every frame for the amount of time you set and interpolating through the values you set. Godot gives you a really useful tool for figuring out what is making your code slow, a profiler. It gives you a good idea of how time is spent through your frame, how long does each function take, how long does your GPU versus CPU take, and which is the bottleneck. As you can see here, my GPU is doing most of the work per frame, and based on all that information, you can fix the stuff that is limiting you. For example, if you're limited by dynamic lighting, you can bake your lighting that does not change. Kinda like how Source 2 games like Sea of Stu and Half-Life Alex do it. If you're overdrawing, you can add LODs which control the level of detail based on how far away you are, or add occlusion calling to not show non-visible objects. All of these solutions are given to you by default on Godot, but you'd never get to know about them if you never read the docs. Which leads me to my next point, the Godot docs are top tier. I've had the experience of, hey, I'm bored, I'll read the Godot docs many times. It teaches you pretty much any concept that you would need in game dev and the engine itself. It's very easy to skim through and it goes over topics like optimizations, shader tutorials, vector math and more. There's also no need to read in order, you can just randomly click on some article, learn something new and then go to another one. The built-in editor documentation is pretty good as well, you can just hover over some function, for example underscore process, and it tells you when it is called, and some functions even have examples on them. You can also have this documentation available when you hover through the NeoVim LSP. Godot in general lacks tutorials, but its documentation makes up for it. As mentioned at the start, one thing that has been annoying on each iteration of my game engine building journey is that a lot of code becomes useless, mainly because I find better ways of doing the same low-level stuff but in other, often, better ways. Since all low-level graphics API stuff is done for you, I found myself not with this problem as much as before because I instead built systems. For example, for interacting, I have an interaction system. For my inventory, I have an inventory system. For movement, I have another system, you get the idea. So all the same code can not only be reused for other components, but in other projects as well. Most items in my game interact like an amnesia, where you have to move your mouse from left to right, top to bottom, or even spin in it. A bunch of this logic can be reused in many cases, in others not so much. This makes it so I refine my systems over time, since I reuse them on each iteration, and it avoids me having to rewrite stuff from scratch. So even if you end up with a totally different idea of a game, since you have been building systems this entire time, you can just change the entire game idea with no major refactoring. Testing in general in game dev is pretty hard to do. One good example of good testing is Minecraft, where they write tests that run in the game itself. Minecraft has a lot of complex systems that interact with each other, so this works well for them, but this doesn't apply to most games. Instead I found myself using assertions a lot. I've had this habit for a while now in all types of applications. They are basically little tests that that run even on release that assert that you never get to an invalid state. This is great for games since everything is state and invalid state is usually going to crash your game or cause undesired behavior. So by asserting you tell your program your world view and how stuff should behave. For example, in my headable component there should never be a moment where interaction cooldown is null and if that ever happens I want to be notified immediately and crash. Godot even sets a breakpoint on the assertion immediately. You might think crashing on assertions is bad, but it actually makes your program more reliable, since now you explicitly handle invalid state and make sure that you never send invalid data from one place to the other. Tiger Beetle, a financial transaction database, does it extensively and it makes it one of the most reliable databases that exist. SQL does it too, and they have over 5,290 assertions. Honestly, I could make an entire video just about assertions and how to write them. Tell me in the comments if you're interested in it. There are many other features that I did not mention, like networking or physics. The point I've been trying to make with this video is that you can keep your game development as low level as you want, even while using a game engine. There's no need to reinvent the wheel if you want to display cool stuff on the screen. This is something I've seen a lot of developers around me suffer with, and I have as well. We want to make cool stuff, but never get to because of the amount of boilerplate that there is to do anything in game dev. Using a game engine like Godot, you get to do the same in less time 
and learn the same amount you would with your own game engine. As far as you're curious enough, since Godot lets you stay at low level where it matters. Anyways, this was all for this video. If you enjoy low level game dev topics or systems programming in general, consider joining my Discord, where we talk about all that cool stuff, and we showcase projects we build. Also, thanks to my loyal channel members for waiting so long for this video. Consider supporting the channel if you enjoy my content, and see you guys later.